The petrol engine fitted to Discovery Series 2 is a 4-litre V8 and is an adaptation of the existing power units. It does, however, have better torque and power characteristics compared with previous units of the same capacity. At first glance, the most obvious new feature is the induction system. The design allows longer induction tracts in a reduced space. These longer induction tracts are largely responsible for the engine's improved torque characteristics. The induction system consists of three components which are bolted together and sealed by vulcanized metal gaskets. The spark plugs used in the V8 are a new design and play a critical role in the performance of the engine. They offer an excellent consistency of performance and a greatly extended service life. They should always be replaced with plugs of the same make and type, that is Champion RC11 PYP B4 plugs. You should never attempt to clean the plugs. The sump is now made of aluminium and sealed with a rubber gasket. It forms part of the structure of the engine. The aluminium and the shape of the sump improve the rigidity of the powertrain and also enhance the overall noise, vibration and harshness characteristics. The engine is controlled by the Bosch M 5.2.1 engine management system. This is designed to optimize the performance of the engine, promote efficiency and keep emissions to a minimum. The ECM is located behind the dash on the right hand A post and secured to a steel bracket. There are five separate electrical connectors. They all interlock and can only be connected and removed in the correct sequence. Automatic derivatives of both petrol and diesel models feature CAN bus technology. CAN stands for Controller Area Network and refers to the electronic link between the ECM and the gearbox. Previously, separate wires were required for the various types of information sent between the two units. CAN bus technology reduces this to just two and they can handle many thousands of signals at once, travelling in both directions. Information is carried down this pair of twisted wires. The twists are a means of reducing the electrical noise generated by the fast moving signals which are carried down the lines. They also help insulate the lines from noise generated by other electrical systems. It may look simple, but the precise length and assembly of the wires is critical. As a result, there is a dedicated repair policy. The engine management system takes input information from many sources, including a number of sensors located around the engine. Let's take a look at some of them. The crankshaft position sensor is here by number 7 cylinder. It protrudes through the cylinder block and into a machined groove in the flywheel or the flex plate. The groove runs through a series of holes. Two of these holes are joined together. As the holes pass the sensor, the position of the engine can be determined. The sensor is fitted on a spacer and attached to the engine by two bolts. The spacer is 14 millimeters thick on a manual engine and 18 millimeters on an automatic. The thickness of the spacer determines how far the sensor protrudes into the reluctor ring on the flywheel. It's very important that the correct sensor is fitted and there are different part numbers for the manual and automatic versions. The sensor is also covered with this protective heat shield. This is the engine coolant temperature sensor. The sensor has four connections, but only two are used on Discovery Series 2. The other two will be used within this engine installation for the 1999 model year Range Rover. The temperature gauge inside the vehicle is worth mentioning. The needle does not rise gradually throughout its range. Rather it rises in a series of predetermined steps. Nor is the coolant temperature sensor connected directly to the gauge. The sensor supplies information to the ECM 
which then decides when to move the needle on the gauge from one step to another. The position that the needle adopts for different engine temperatures can in fact be programmed into the ECM. In practice, this means that the gauge may stay in one position across a span of engine temperatures, but then rise a number of steps in a more critical temperature range. If the coolant temperature sensor fails, the gauge will default to reading cold, and the overheat warning lamp will be illuminated. This informs the driver that the gauge is no longer reading the engine temperature. The engine has two knock sensors, one to monitor each bank of four cylinders. The sensors contain a piezo-ceramic crystal. The crystal produces a voltage whenever a mechanical force exerts a load onto it. In this way, it detects the force as each cylinder fires. The ECM can compare these signals with programmed tunes for given engine conditions. If the readings from the sensors differ significantly from the programmed tune, it would indicate that one of the cylinders is not firing correctly. The knock sensors must always be fixed at the correct torque. They may give false readings if they are over or under tight. Also, the reliability of the signal they supply depends heavily on the quality of the contact that the sensor has with the engine body. The preparation of the sensor surface and the torque of the fixing bolt are both critical, and it's important that the instructions in the technical manual are followed. The air mass flow meter is situated between the air filter housing and the intake manifold. It tells the ECM how much air is entering the engine. It actually contains two sensors. One is an air temperature sensor. The second sensor is a hot film element. This is kept at a constant temperature by a circuit. As air passes over, the element is cooled. The greater the flow of air, the greater the cooling effect. The ECM monitors the level of current needed to keep the element at its predetermined temperature. The information from these two sensors allows the ECM to calculate the mass of air entering the engine. The whole unit is very delicate, and so care must be taken to avoid any shocks. It must always be fitted the correct way round between the air filter housing and the intake manifold. Never connect the unit directly to the battery, as you will damage its internal circuitry. Like several other sensors, the terminals have a precious metal coating to provide a good quality connection, and so care must be taken not to damage the surface when using probes, for example. Most vehicles are fitted with two oxygen sensors to monitor exhaust emissions. There are four on North American specification. The rear two are used to monitor the efficiency of the catalytic converter. When there are four sensors, two are located in each downpipe. One is before the catalyst, referred to as the pre-catalyst sensor, and one is after, referred to as the post-catalyst sensor. Pre- and post-catalyst sensors are different and cannot be interchanged. On vehicles with just two sensors, only the pre-catalyst sensors are fitted. The sensors contain a galvanic cell, which is surrounded by a gas-permeable ceramic material. Exhaust gases come into contact with one side of the cell, while the other side is open to the atmosphere. This produces a voltage, the size of which depends on the difference in oxygen level detected on each side of the cell. The voltage falls as the oxygen content of the exhaust gases rises. The signal is supplied to the ECM, which can adjust the ignition fueling accordingly. The oxygen sensors are very sensitive. Care should be taken when handling them, as any damage could prevent them from working correctly. 
you can find details of how to change them in the technical manual. The ECM governs the engine's idle speed via an actuator located behind the throttle body on the intake manifold. One hose connects upstream of the throttle valve and the other connects downstream. So the actuator provides a bypass to the throttle valve. The ECM controls the idle speed by allowing a measured quantity of air into the engine when the throttle valve is closed. The actuator contains a rotary valve and two electrical coil windings. When a voltage is supplied to the coils, they produce opposing magnetic fields in the coils. When the voltages are altered by the ECM, the position of the rotary valve moves, allowing more or less air to reach the engine. The throttle position sensor, or TPS, is located here in the throttle valve shaft. It monitors the position and any movement of the throttle valve, which is controlled by the driver via the throttle pedal and accelerator cable. The sensor is a potentiometer. It receives a supply of 5 volts when the ignition is switched on and returns a proportion of this depending on the position of the throttle valve. From 0.1 volts when the throttle valve is fully closed to 4.8 when fully open. The TPS does not require any form of adjustment or calibration. The ECM is able to learn the closed throttle position itself. If the ECM detects a problem with the TPS, it will introduce a substitute signal based on information it receives from other sensors. If this happens, the driver will notice reduced performance and test book can be used to trace the problem. North American markets also have an evaporative loss control system, or ELC, to detect the level of fuel vapor emissions from the vehicle. It works like this. The ECM purges the charcoal canister of vapor and then closes the air vent valve. The engine carries on drawing vapor from the charcoal canister and this produces a depression in the fuel tank. When the depression reaches a certain point, the purge valve is closed. This seals the fuel system with a pressure lower than atmospheric. The ECM monitors the rate at which the pressure in the fuel tank rises to atmospheric pressure due to fuel evaporation. This is compared to a pre-programmed calibration. If there is a leak in the fuel system, the pressure would rise more quickly than normal. It's worth noting that this test is only carried out if the vehicle is stationary. When any condition such as a hot ambient temperature or excessive movement of fuel in the tank would increase evaporation, the test is cancelled. We've already mentioned programmed tunes. These are patterns of engine data which give the ECM a reference. By comparing the information that it receives from the sensors with the appropriate programmed tune for that condition, the ECM can decide whether the engine is performing correctly. It may be possible for the ECM to correct any deviation from the programmed tune by altering an aspect of the engine performance. Or it may be that the deviation is caused by a fault. However, these tunes are programmed into the ECM before the vehicle has been driven any distance and before it has reached the environment in which it will work. Program tunes give the ECM a standard starting point against which to monitor the performance of the engine. But every vehicle will be slightly different and each engine will perform in a slightly different way. The ECM, therefore, has the ability to learn from engine data that it receives over time and adapt the program tunes for different engine conditions. In this way, it can take account of variations in engine manufacture, engine condition and the ambient conditions under which it operates. These variations in the program tunes are called adaptions. 
they can be displayed, usually as a percentage value, by test book. They provide an instant view of how far the engine management system is having to alter its known values in order to maintain correct emissions and engine performance. The adaptions that the ECM makes will usually be within a narrow band around a normal mean value. When adaptions are straying outside this band, it's an indication that something may be wrong. The ECM is having to overcompensate for a problem somewhere. Looking at adaptions gives a very early warning of potential problems, because they'll often be affected before a fault code is registered and the vehicle's performance is seriously compromised, and indeed before the customer is aware of any problem. Most adaptions are learned by the ECM from its analysis of the engine's performance. This is a continuous process. There are other components which have their own adaptions associated with them. These are the idle speed control valve, the throttle position sensor, the oxygen sensors and the airflow meter. There are in total about 70 adaptions and when certain components are replaced, the adaption must be reset. This is done using test book. When a fault occurs, the ECM stores one or several fault codes from a comprehensive range. It also stores environmental data relevant to the fault. This can be any three from a possible 12 different readings. It also records some additional data. This includes the number of occurrences of the fault, whether the fault is currently present, historic, intermittent, or any combination of these. The ECM also notes the current time that the fault occurred. The current time counts the number of ignition on hours beginning from zero when the ECM is powered up. If the battery is disconnected, the clock will reset to zero hours and all stored fault codes will be lost. However, the ECM will retain the adaptions that it has learned. This detailed level of information is invaluable when it comes to fault diagnosis and rectification. Fault codes can be printed out from test book to provide a permanent record of the vehicle's fault history. The ECM is pre-programmed during manufacture, when the engine program and tune are written into the ECM memory. The ECM can be subsequently reprogrammed using test book. When it's connected, test book can tell you if the ECM currently contains an old version of the software or vehicle tune. It may be that you'll need to load the latest version if it applies to the vehicle that you're working on. When you're loading software into the ECM, it's very important that the process is not interrupted. This could result in an incomplete program or vehicle tune being stored, which could corrupt the ECM. It's worth noting too that the new programs are not written over old ones. The ECM has a finite amount of space in it. Software editions use up this space until eventually the memory will be full. If an ECM has been changed, you'll need to reprogram the security link for the BCU which controls the alarm system. This is done via test book. You'll need to do this even if the alarm system is not operational within the market specification or there is no robust immobilization. Without the ECM and the BCU talking to each other the vehicle will start but then immediately stop again. After an ECM change, the engine may not run with its normal refinement while it learns the correct level of each of the adaptions.